Good afternoon. Shall we start? I hope all of you can hear us. If anybody can't hear, please raise your hands. So, I hope all of you are doing your assignments and uh, I have a request uh, for assignments. When you do the assignments, please uh, don't change the format. Uh, please keep it in the word itself because the uh, evaluating, uh, evaluating faculty, he will not be able to uh, evaluate properly if you change it to PDF. So please keep it in word and don't delete any options in the um, multiple choice or any other questions. Please keep all the questions alike and don't uh, make any changes. You can uh, uh, indicate the correct answer in multiple choice by just changing the color of the correct answer. There is some echo. So uh, let's, uh, do you have any doubts regarding assignments? If anybody have any doubts, please ask. Okay. Let's move on to uh, today's session. So this is the uh, first session in gastrointestinal symptoms, uh, nausea, vomiting, and constipation. So nausea and vomiting, constipation, these are some very important issues in palliative care. Uh, and many patients will end up with uh, constipation. And uh, maybe as a consequence of, uh, of uh, constipation or as uh, due to any other problem, nausea and vomiting occurs in many of the patients. So today's session will be handled by Dr. Babaraj. Dr. Babaraj is the additional professor in uh, Medical College, Manjari. And uh, he was a uh, palliative care physician who was with us uh, for uh, two years. And he left us uh, three years back. Uh, so he is actively involved in palliative care training and uh, he's an academician also. So I request Dr. Babaraj uh, to take over the session. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Today we will be dealing with <coughs> the two important symptoms. One is nausea vomiting and second one is constipation. Nausea and vomiting are very common and of course distressing. Let's define these three terminologies. Nausea, retching and vomiting. Nausea means this is an unpleasant subjective sensation with a feeling of need to vomit. You cannot measure it because it is subjective. Associated with loss of autonomic symptoms like sweating, salivation, tachycardia, and pain. So, what follows nausea? It is retching. Retching is this rhythmic spasmodic contractions of diaphragm and abdominal muscles. Diaphragm is moving down and abdominal muscles are moving in, which facilitates regurgitation of the contents from stomach into the esophagus. Then comes the vomiting, which is the expulsion of all the gastric contents by forceful as well as sustained contraction of diaphragm and abdominal muscles. In the retching, there was only rhythmic contractions, but here it is forceful as well as sustained so that stomach is literally squeezed and everything is out. From the picture you can see, 
there's an important sender, omitting sender, which coordinates all the components of the omitting duplex. You can see the impulses from the omitting sender is moving and causing contraction diaphragm and other muscles. You can see the respiration is being stopped. The lower esophageal sphincter is a sphincter in the lower part of the esophagus, which prevents the reflex of gastric complex, which is relaxed. Then comes anti peristalsis. Peristalsis in the reverse order. The glottis is closed to protect the lungs, and soft palate is elevated so that nothing goes into the nose. Then everything is omitted. This is the act of omitting, mediated by the omitting center. Now, regarding incidence, 20 to 30 percentage of all patients with advanced cancer will have this nausea. Which is more distressing, nausea or vomiting? Nausea is more distressing than vomiting. And most of them, the last week of life, 70 percentage will have this nausea. And patients on morphine, one third of these patients will have nausea as well vomiting during the first week. But by that time, the tolerance will develop and the vomiting will subside. It is also seen in other cancers like the anaphylactic cancers, stomach cancers, and breast cancer. Well, let us learn something. Neural pathways of nausea and vomiting. What is the need to learn all this physiology? The reason being, if you know the pathway, if you know the receptor, if you know the antagonist to this particular receptor, the nausea and vomiting can be managed more effectively. There are three centers concerned with nausea and vomiting. The first two, chemoreceptor zone and vomiting center, facilitates vomiting, and the third one. Medullary antiemetic tone is something which prevents nausea. So what is CT? Sir? What is chemoreceptor chemoreceptor? In the picture, you can see the cerebellum here, and anterior to cerebellum is the fourth ventricle. And in the flow of the fourth ventricle, you can see something called chemoreceptor chemoreceptor, which is in the flow of the And a little far away, Anteriorly, you can see another center which is known as the vomiting center. You can see the chemoreceptor zone some, some, somewhere here and vomiting center are in close proximity. So, CT is at where is it situated? It is in the floor of the fourth ventricle. And I would like to underline this last sentence where there is no blood drain barrier. That means any drugs, any toxic compounds in the blood. Easily can cross and stimulate chemoreceptor to the zone. So, this is a cross section. You can see in the floor of the fourth ventricle where there is no blood brain barrier, there is a CTZ and omity center is in a little angle. That's about CTZ. Now, omitic center, I already showed the picture, it is in the middle. And there are so many neural connections connecting the CTZ and the center, and it is known as the central pattern generator. If you cut away the only center, nobody is able to do it. Because that is something which coordinates the somatomotor components of wound. And you can also see in this picture the vomiting center gets so many afferents from higher centers like hypothalamus, cerebellum, labyrinth, and CT cell. I will explain later on. Now, medically antiemetic tone, this is something which prevents nausea and vomiting. That is why, even though morphine is given, only one third vomits, probably other two thirds may be having a strong antiemetic tone. This slide shows the outputs from vomiting center, that is the vomiting of plants, and also the inputs to omitic center. If you take one by one, one is a higher cortical center. When you see, when you have a fear, or when you have severe pain, you may have the nausea and vomiting, which is by the stimulation from the higher cortical center. And on the left side, you can see the chemoreceptor trigger zone, which is also sending inputs to omitic center. And the third one on the left side is the GI tract, gastrointestinal tract, which sends impulses towards vomiting center, 
also be the kidney structures. The fourth one, that is the lower part, is the labyrinth, which is situated in the middle area. So, from all these areas, labyrinth, JT, chemosal trigger zone, and higher cortical centers, impulses reach vomiting center, which is known as a central pattern later, which initiates the kidney. Let us learn something about the receptors because the knowledge about this is important. Only then you can think about and antagonists to these receptors and make them effective. The receptors in the CTSL are the major one is dopamine 2. You can also say serotonin, that is 5 hydroxy tryptamine. So, the two important receptors in the CTSL are dopamine 2 and 5 HT3, and the major one is dopamine 2. Vomiting center, it has got about 3 histamine, acetylcholine, and 5 HT2. Just yeah, forget about 5 HT2. Histamine and spectrocholine are major receptors in the Now we learned about three, four major receptors. Number one, dopamine two. Number two, five hydroxytryptamine. Number three, histamine. And number four, acetylcholine. Now coming to cerebral cortex, here you see the major receptor is gamma amino butyric acid. GABA. It is short term as GABA. When you think about the Cancer center from you are going to have the chemotherapy, you get nausea, which is mediated through that. And a second type of receptor same in the brain is the mechano receptors. They are not the same as that of GABA, they are a different one. Mechano receptors seen in meninges. The stretching of mechano receptors will cause nausea and thing. A typical example would be a raised intravenous. A fear or anxiety causes nausea and vomiting by stimulation of GABA. Raise the XCP causes nausea and vomiting through stimulation of mechanical surfaces. In vestibular system, we have got acetylcholine receptors as well, histamine receptors. And in gut, it is easy to remember the GAT people, so acetylcholine receptors are abandoned. In addition, you can find out histamine as well. So, so far we learned about, about I think five receptors. One is dopamine 2, second one is serotonin, third one is acetylcholine, fourth one is histamine, fifth one is GABA, and the sixth one is the mechano receptors in the brain. Now let us see. How these receptors are stimulated in each area. Here is the CTZ where there is no blood brain barrier, and the major receptor is dopamine 2. What are the stimulants? Morphine, opioids, digoxin, hypercalcemia, calcium, and uremia. Somebody with renal failure having chronic nausea. The reason is the stimulation of dopamine 2 receptors by the uremic. Okay, we move on to the cortex. Here you can see two types of receptors. One is GABA, of course, stimulated by fear, anxiety, and you can also see mechano receptors, which are stimulated by high intracranial pressure. And the third, gut. I already said acetylcholine receptors are seen in abundance. So, in intestinal obstruction, these receptors are stimulated. Gastric irritants, chemotherapeutic agents, as well as abdominal radiotherapy. So, in these situations, these receptors are stimulated. And then comes vestibular nuclei. The stimulants are movement. Patient develops nausea and vomiting whenever there is movement. All this nausea and vomiting is associated with the table. You can think about the source as vestibular nuclei, and all receptors stimulated are streptocholine. From all these centers, the impulses go and stimulate vomiting center, and finally, vomiting center, which is also known as central pattern generator, initiates the vomiting reflex. So, the best method to treat nausea vomiting is blocking the receptors at various sites. 
So you can think about the antagonist, dopamine to antagonist, serotonin antagonist, acetylcholine antagonist, histamine antagonist, and also gamma antagonist. Now regarding history, how to take history when a patient comes with nausea The timing of symptom is very important. Suppose it occurs soon after means, the cause could be gastric stasis. And if it occurs on movement, there is an associated vertigo, it could be a vestibular problem. When our patient lies flat, he develops nausea, it could be a raised LCP, you know, lying position can increase in drug intention. If the patient thinks about hospital or chemotherapy, he gets nausea. So it happens few hours after intake, could be an obstruction down. History continues. It's also essential to take history regarding food and fluid intake to differentiate between nausea and vomiting. Sometimes patients may say, oh, I have been suffering from nausea and vomiting since three days. And when you take the history, you will see that patient had breakfast today, patient had dinner yesterday, but no incidents of vomiting. So obviously that patient is suffering from nausea rather than vomiting. And this particular history gives you a clue regarding the whole status of the patient. Not drugs, many drugs used in palliative care are gastric stimulants and emetics, for example, opioids, NSAIDs. Based pain can cause nausea, especially severe pain. Bowel habits, constipation, chronic constipation, because of the slow movement of the intestines can give on to nausea. You know, but of course, gives you an idea regarding the intravascular bowel stamps. And always ask, how does this particular symptom affect you? Now regarding examination, assess hydration status. Look for signs of fever because infection is manifested as nausea and nausea, especially in elderly. Jaundice, probably the earliest sign or symptom of jaundice will be just nausea. Neurological examination, particularly a raised ACP can be ruled out by Endoscopy. Abdominal examination includes looking for tenderness, looking for distension, ascites, muscles, and epitomelia. Rectal examination is also done if you have doubt regarding constipation. Now, something about gastric stasis. This is a dominant problem in palliative care. The main complaints from the patient will be feeling of fullness. Epigastric pain or distress, reflux is a fibrosis, hiccups probably the stomach is stimulating the diaphragm. Early satiety, the patient may be having hunger, but one small amount of food is taken, the hunger or satiety, early satiety happens. And there will be minimum or no nausea with larval movement, indicating gastric stasis. And once he or she moments out, Symptoms inside. Regarding investigations, hyponatremia, nausea vomiting can happen, uremia it can happen, hypercalcemia, the symptom will be nausea vomiting. LFT is important to rule out this. TCDC gives you regarding an idea regarding infections, urine culture, abdominal ultrasound, x ray, or other investigations if you think. The results are going to improve the quality of life of patients. You can ask for all these investigations. Of course, the symptom is managed under three subheadings correcting the correctable, pharmacological measures, and non pharmacology measures. Now, what are the non pharmacology measures? Avoid cooking smell. If the smell of the food from the kitchen comes and patient smells it, sometimes patient may develop. The nausea. Ask the patient what are the things you don't like. If the unpleasant orders, you can ask the patient. Small attractive meals, rather than three big meals, you give smaller but attractive meals with different menus. Some book says even whole things are preferred over whole things. See, so this slide shows three big meals, appears monotonous. Instead, you can give small, 
but frequent means with different menu. So that is more acceptable to the patient than big means. But think about corrective factors, constipation, you can manage it. Changing from one opioid to another, some opioids, remote is more emetic than methadone. Steroids, or even radiation <laughs> to manage intracranial tension. Electric imbalances, because hyponatremia, hypercalcemia can cause nausea and vomiting. So, if possible, you can correct them. Hydration status, gastric irritation can be managed with H2 blockers or inhibitors like omeprazole, gabiprazole, or androprazole. Infections can be treated with antibiotics. And hypercalcemia, of course, is a palliative care emergency, can be managed with hydration and bisphosphonates. Well, what are the pharmacology methods? So, we discussed the correctable factors and non pharmacology methods. Now, we'll move on to the pharmacology methods. Identify the pathway. That is why we learned about the neural pathways in bone. Identify the receptor. Identify the most potent antagonist. Then the right route of administration that is also very important. In a patient with incessant vomiting, there is no meaning in prescribing oral drugs. In them, we may prefer the parental one. But somebody with nausea, of course, you can move from parental to endron root if nausea, if vomiting is not happening. And always titrate the dose to review, and then only you can restrain to the real dosage shape. And let us discuss the drugs used. Metaprochromate, also known as pedinone. It has got dopamine 2 antagonism, and in high doses, it has got some serotonin antagonism also. It is also a prokinetic So, in the uh, cell, in the brain, it inhibits dopamine 2, and in the stomach, it facilitates gastric empty. It has got one more action that is, it can. Strengthen the lower esophageal sphincter tone, LES. So it has got three actions one central and two peripheral actions. This is the dosage, you can give 10 milligrams, 4 to 6 thousand, and maximum dose per day is 100 milligrams. It can be given orally, intravenously, and also subcutaneously. So it is a drug of choice in gastric stasis because it has got prokinesis. It is also indicated in opioid induced vomiting because it has got dopamine 2 antagonism. And in high doses, it may be useful in vomiting due to chemotherapy because it has got serotonin antagonism. But the problem is the side effect of metoprochromide is extra periodontal symptoms. If it happens, we have to treat with injection IV promethazine. IV carnitine is a drug of choice for treating extra periodontal symptoms. Now moving on to haloperidol, this is the most potent dopamine 2 antagonist. So haloperidol is the drug of choice for morphine induced nausea and vomiting. And it is also useful in treating nausea and vomiting due to metabolic causes. For example, somebody with renal failure or liver failure, the toxins are entering into the CT cell and stimulating the dopamine 2. Haloperidol is the drug of choice. This is the dosage schedule, 1.5 mg to 3 mg, 8 hourly. It can be given per hourly, sub-Q as well as IV. And maximum dosage per day is 20 mg. In a patient with chronic therapy with haloperidol, you have to look for muscle rigidity. If muscle rigidity happens, you have to stop the therapy. Rarely happens, EPS rarely happens in a patient who is on. So we learned about two drugs, one is metoprochromide and second one is haloperidol. On citronoprochromide, the commonest antiemetic used by the medical profession is known as, also known as emiset. But it has got antagonist action only on serotonin receptors, not effective for vomiting due to stimulation of other receptors. Hence, it is a drug of choice in chemotherapy induced nausea vomiting. It is a drug of choice in nausea and vomiting due to abdominal radiotherapy, and it can also have a role in nausea and vomiting due to the infrastructure because there are a lot of serotonin receptors in the 
gastrointestinal tract. This is the dosage schedule, 4 to 8 milligram interval. It can be given PO, IV, and CQ. Chronic intake of ontraceptone can lead on to two side effects. One is headache, and second one is constipation. And third one is sex phosphate. Going to drain the patient's urine. Moving we'll on to the next drug, hyosin. It is an anticholinergic, so it is an acetylcholine antagonist. Hyosin butyl bromide, commonly known as buscopan, is useful. So it can be used in cases of intestinal obstruction as well as those with peritoneal means. But the side effects are dry mouth. Once you push the buscopan in, the patient will have tachycardia, worsening as palpitation. Patient have blurred vision due to difficulty digestion, and that can be dry mouth also. Remember, never use anticholinergic and metoprotromide concurrently. This is because for the metoprotromide to act, there should be a cholinergic background activity. If you give an anticholinergic, that background activity is lost. So there is no use in giving metoprotromide. So never combine metoprotromide with buscopan. Cyclicine is an antihistaminic. It has got action on acetylcholinesterase also. So, nausea and vomiting from vestibular cause. This is the nausea and vomiting happening on women. Probably a vestibular cause, cyclism is a useful drug. It's also useful in race ACP because there are many histamine receptors in the brain. And also useful in kidney structure because H1 receptors are seen in T8 also. The dosage is about 25 to 50 milligram, given orally and subtly as well IV. The side effects are sedation, and these means can cause sedation, and also dry mouth. Down peridone, also known as down stars. This is a preferred antiemetic in pediatric population. It is a document to antagonist, and like metoprolamide, it has also got pro clinic activity. It is available as oral preparation, so dosage is about 30 to 80 milligrams. Dexamethasone, it's a steroid, it can reduce ICP, it can reduce peritoneal edema, it can also reduce the permeability of VBB. That means Dexona can strengthen this blood brain barrier. So, in palliative care, we use high dose 60 milligram once a day or divided into two doses morning and lunch time. Even for three days, you call it a steroid trial. If it is effective, you can. I trade the dose to process in daily and continue. Benzodiazepines. Now, benzodiazepines are GABA and the best. So, benzodiazepines are the drugs of choice for anticipatory nausea and vomiting. And the commonly used drug is Milovasapam, 1 to 3 mg HS. This is a broad spectrum antiemetic, of course, not available in India. You can see it acts on many receptors. It is an antagonist to dopamine 2, H1, by H2. Then comes octreotide. This is a somatostatin analog. It has got anti secretory effect without any anti spasmodic effect. So it is useful particularly in nausea and vomiting due to induced obstruction. The dosage is about 100 milligrams, 6 other is cutaneous or IV, and this is a costly drug. So, to summarize, in opioid induced vomiting, motion induced vomiting, the drug of choice is haloperidol, but for practical purpose, we use metoprolamide. Chemotherapy, the drug of choice is ontanceptron with dexamethasone. Real failure, you know, document to stimulation causes vomiting. So, Haloprenol is a drug choice. Functional gastric stasis. We can make use of prokinetic properties of metoprolamide and domperidol. And raised ACP, dexamethasone, and cyclizine. Vestibular disturbance, cyclizine is a drug choice. And malignant bowel obstruction, we can use metoprolamide, steroid, or iosin and control. Never use metoprolamide with. I
to sum up. The cause is always multifactorial. Always try to correct the correctable. A simple example is chronic constipation. Non-pharmacological measures already I mentioned. Asking the patient about the likes and dislikes, providing small frequent meals or frequently meals. Drug treatment improves. Identifying the pathway, identifying the receptors, identifying the antagonist, and choose the right route of administration. And instead of a single drug, you can go for combination drugs. Steroids definitely have a role in managing nausea and vomiting. Remember, contraception is a very expensive drug. Now, let us see some true or false statements just for completion sake. Contraception or emicet is an appropriate drug for managing nausea and vomiting in cancer. You know, contraception is a Serotonin antagonist. So it is a drug of choice in managing nausea and vomiting due to chemotherapy. Or it can also be used in patients undergoing abdominal radiotherapy. So the statement is true. Moving on to the second statement. Benzodiazepines are useful in some form of chronic nausea and vomiting. Of course, benzodiazepines antagonizes GABA. So in anticipatory nausea and vomiting or cortical nausea and vomiting, when patients think about chemotherapy or the cancer center, the drug of choice is benzodiazepines. So that statement is also true. Metoprotomine has got both central and peripheral action. Of course, it antagonizes dopamine too and it is a prokinetic. It also strengthens the lower esophageal sphincter. So it has got two peripheral action and one central action. It is true. The drug of choice in morphine induced vomiting is haloperidol. Because haloperidol has got the highest dopamine antagonism. So the drug of choice is haloperidol. But for practical purpose, we give metoprotomide because haloperidol is an antipsychiatric drug. If the vomiting is not controlled with metoprotomide, of course, you can give you tablets of haloperidol and ask the patient to have it if the vomiting and was the resistant to it. Thank you. Uh, I think before moving on to the next session, uh, we can spend a few minutes on clearing some doubts or concerns about nausea and vomiting. Those who are speaking, kindly uh, raise hands or just unmute yourself before talking. Yes, Dr. Bindu. We will, uh, yeah, please. Uh, Dr. Bindu, uh, you are not audible. No? Yes, yes, ah, now you are audible. audible. Please. Uh, is uh, reaching and hiccups the same thing? Reaching and hiccups. Are they the same? Pardon? Retching and hiccup. No, no, no. Is it the same thing? No, no, they are not the same. Retching means that is something happening after nausea, before vomiting. Hiccups means whenever stomach is inflated, the stomach can stimulate the diaphragm and the diaphragm moves spasmodically. That is hiccups. Retching is occurring in between nausea and vomiting. Okay. Is it clear? Thank you. Uh, sir, uh, at, uh, right now I have a patient, he had uh, colon cancer and he has a diversion colostomy. He is in stage 4 and he is having intractable hiccups. He is on baclofen TDS and uh, perinom injectable TDS. In spite of that, he, is continu he continues to have hiccups. Uh, do you have uh, anything more to give him for this? Now, how much baclofen patient is getting? Daily? Sorry? Baclofen, dosage of baclofen, 10 milligram? 10, mil 10 milligram TDS. TD, TAD. TAD. Okay. This patient is on any protein like perinol? 
Have you started perinom? Yeah, he is also given perinom TDS injectable. You can increase the dosage of perinom. Ten milligram you can increase to six thousandly. Okay. And what about uh, the the are the, the the palpation of abdomen is it distended? Abdomen distended? No, no. He the colostomy is doing well. It is uh, working. What about his renal function? Any uremia? Uh, it is not checked recently. He is passing urine. The uremic patients can also uh, develop hiccups, uh, and you can also increase the dose of baclofen, ten milligram. You can increase to twenty milligram. What is the suggestion? Twenty milligram PID. Ah, yeah. There is no need to increase all of a sudden. Uh, Out of the TID dosage, one dose, one dose schedule, you can increase to twenty milligram. Okay. Ten TID, uh, or you can ten, ten, twenty at night because the clofen can can cause sedation as well as weakness. So you can increase the night dosage to twenty milligram, and also high the dosage of metoprolol. Okay. Milligram six to twelve. Yes. Can be added dexamethasone and uh, octreotide also for this patient. Octreotide is available there. Is it available? Octreotide. Octreotide is it available in your? Uh, octreotide is available. It is costly. It is available. No, okay. Indication only if there is some obstruction, because it can reduce the gas, the industrial contents. So I think there is no need to add octreotide now, but definitely you can add dexamethasone. You can even have a dexamethasone trial, 16 milligram only for three days, and see the response. And if the response is good, you can continue dexamethasone in a lower dosage, 8 milligram and then 12 milligram. Is it clear? Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I think we can we can take one more question if there is any, uh, or else we'll move on to the next session. Uh, shall we move on to the next session then about constipation Next session is constipation. See if you take the uh, symptom, the list of symptoms in palliative care: pain, dyspnea, vomiting. All these are self-reported by the patients. But constipation is a typical symptom, which is less reported than the other symptoms. Why? The reason being, for a layman, constipation is Not causing stress, but we know the medical definition of constipation is passage of small feces infrequently and with difficulty, or feces, hard feces, infrequent. The patient was passing stools every day. Now pass stools on some alternate day. It is constipation. Patient is passing globular stool. It is constipation. Patient passes stools every day, but with difficulty. It is also constipation. So that means there is a difference in definition for us and for a lay person. So constipation remains a less reported symptom compared to other symptoms. So it is our duty to elicit this particular symptom from our patients. Now, when the liquid industry contents are entering into the colon, as the water is absorbed, the stools become hardened, and excess absorption of water leads to hard stools. That means two factors determine the consistency of stools. One is water content. Anything that can lead on reduce water content can cause constipation, or anything which can reduce chronic movement 
So you don't do oxidation. In the left side picture, you can see the stools are there only in the rectum. Normally, the stools are collected only in the rectum. In the picture shown on the right side, you can see that the stools are collected not only in the rectum, but also in the colon, which indicates chronic oxidation. Here is a vicious circle. Somebody is constipated. The feces is accumulating in the bubble, which reduces the diameter of the bubble. When the diameter of the bubble is reduced, the fecal matter takes longer time to pass. When longer time is taken, more water is absorbed and the vicious circle goes on. So you have to break the vicious circle. Now what are the symptoms? Symptoms are classified into two. One is symptoms due to constipation. And second is symptoms due to complications of constipation. Symptoms due to constipation are flatulence and vomiting. Abdominal pain, especially lower or the sub umbilical area, and feeling of incomplete evacuation. Patient goes to the toilet very frequently. He goes, comes back. There is a feeling of incomplete evacuation and again goes, this is a symptom of constipation. Now what are the symptoms of complication? Anorexia. The bowel movement is reduced naturally, which is going to cause anorexia. Overflow diarrhea. The patient develops diarrhea. Let us see the mechanism of overflow diarrhea. This is also known as spurious diarrhea. This picture shows the hard stools collected in the rectum, also in the colon. The upper part of this stool is disintegrated by the bacteria and the stools become liquefied and the liquid stools seeps out between the hard stools and the colonic wall and finally moves out as incontinence of stools. So for a patient, it is not constipation, it is diarrhea. But patient is suffering from chronic constipation. This is known as overflow diarrhea, also known as spurious diarrhea. So typical history will be like this. Constipation for one week or more than that. And suddenly patient develops diarrhea. And patient will be telling the symptoms of diarrhea to you. If you take a leading question, if you give a leading question, you will be able to elicit the history that there was a few days of constipation. So you can have a diagnosis that when the patient is suffering from spurious diarrhea or overflow diarrhea, and you have to manage this by taking measures for managing constipation. Confusion, especially in the elderly, the constipation may manifest as delirium or confusion. No CM vomiting, urinary dysfunction. If you can have urinary obstetrics or urinary obstruction, hemorrhoids. Patient who was suffering from hemorrhoids, it can be accentuated, or patient can develop new hemorrhoids, or even anal fissures can develop. These are the symptoms of complications of constipation. Now, let us see the causes of constipation. It is divided into Caused by cancer, hypercalcemia, it is a magnetic emergency, or hypokalemia, you know, potassium, low potassium can reduce the industrial movements and can lead to constipation. Interabdominal or pelvic disease, of course, that is going to reduce the bowel movements. Neural plexus invasion or spinal cord compression or cordyopenia, these three are related to the nervous supply of the intestine and slow movement can lead to constipation. Clinical depression. We know anxiety causes diarrhea and depression causes constipation. Debility. Patient is weak, patient is bedridden. So constipation is likely to happen. The nutrition status is very poor. Fluid intake is very bad. Or confusion. A delirious patient will suffer from constipation because patient may not be able to tell you that, okay, I'm having the reflex. So that type of that patients are likely to suffer from constipation. Inability to reach the toilet is also a cause of constipation. 
Now, many drugs can cause constipation, like opioids. They are notorious for causing constipation. Antiemetic, especially ondansetron, antihistaminics, anticholinergics. They are going to reduce the bowel movements. Antispasmodics like buscopan is going to reduce the bowel movements. Antidepressants can also cause constipation. Aluminium salt, you know, jellucil contains both aluminium and magnesium, and aluminium salts are constipating drugs. NSAIDs and also diuretics. Something about opioid induced constipation, constipation because this is a common thing which you see in palliative care. A patient who is on morphine, we know morphine is going to reduce the peristalsis. In addition, because of the effect of morphine on mu receptors in the rectum, the rectal mucosa is less sensitive to this tension. So, the patient will not have an urge to go to the toilet because the mucosa is desensitized because of the mu receptors. And this leads to slow passage of feces. More water is absorbed whenever stool is moving slowly, and that can lead to constipation. How to assess? You have to ask the patient regarding the frequency of stools as well as consistency of stool. There is something called Bristol stool chart. You can see type 1 means lump like stools, type 2 it is sausage, but having lumps and also cracks and type 3 is having sausage but again with cracks and type 4 is like sausage or snake and the normal stool is the type 4. Type 3 and type 4 are acceptable. Type 2 and type 1 indicates constipation by the others soft blobs, fluffy pieces, watery, these are indicating you area. So you can show the Bristol chart to the patient and ask the patient what type of stools you pass. So assessment of consistency of stool is very important to diagnose the constitution. Then you can ask about other symptoms like nausea, vomiting, lower abdomen pain, mobility of the patient, diet patient is on, access to toilet or commode is also very important. Lack of privacy is important, but there is lack of privacy, naturally patient is going to be constipated. Need for nurses or carers. So this can also lead to constipation. When you need somebody's help for toilet activities, constipation is going to be more. The palpation of abdomen is very important. In a thin patient, the stools are palpable per abdomen, especially in the left iliac fossa. They appear as Intendable masses, usually non tender, and mobile also. If it is a tumor mass, they are not intendable, they are fixed, they are not mobile, and they are tender. This is how you differentiate between a tumor mass and a stool mass. Auscultation sometimes abdomen will be silent, and sometimes you can hear high pitched bowel sounds. If you suspect constipation in any patient, with the consent of the patient, you should do a digital examination of the rectum. If the patient is having a colostomy, you can do a digital examination of the stomach also. Regarding pain, we are taught that believe the patient. But regarding constipation, don't believe the patient because for a layman, constipation is not passing stress. So what are things you what are the information you are going to get from digital examination? Usually, patient is in left lap position. You have to wear the gloves. Of course, lubricating gently. It should be gentle also. You ask the patient to have deep inspiration. And you introduce the finger from the sides, not vertically down. And once the finger passes the anal canal, you can feel the mucosa of the rectum around your finger. If there is a hard mass, you can feel. If there's a tumor, you can feel. If there are hemorrhoids, you can feel. Anal fissures, extremely painful. Ulceration, this is something you can not during your rectal examination. Sometimes during your PR, you find that 
the rectum is empty. But instead of the mucosa abetting to your finger, you will see it is a balloon type of rectum. So balloon type of rectum, empty rectum indicates that there is stool or there are stool masses up, not in the rectum, but in the colon. So it is an indicator of hard stools in the colon, which tells you that the patient is suffering from chronic constipation. Now, constipation is also a very important symptom. Sometimes it may be a heraldic symptom of spinal cord compression. During your PR, you see the sphincter is relaxed, lax sphincter, or there is no sensation in the rectum, or there is perianal anesthesia. It's a warning sign that your patient is suffering from spinal cord compression. And of course, he, need, she, he or she needs complete neurological deficit because a palliative RT may be useful if it is a spinal cord compression due to vertebral collapse. And plain x ray of abdomen, usually the stool is appearing as clumps of rounded masses with enteral gas. Always prevention is better. The layman, the lay people think that constipation is the logical result of not eating properly. When you ask the patient, do you suffer from constipation? They say, ah, yes, I am suffering from constipation because I am not eating anything. So for them, it is a result of not eating anything. So you have to explain the reasons of constipation and you have to discuss the measures to mitigate it also. Better you prevent rather than treat constipation. Adequate fluid intake is to be ensured. Fruit fiber is good because it will increase the amount of stools. Think about constipating medications. Most of the drugs used in palliative care are constipating. Better you go for laxatives. A pen is right morphine. You can also write this That's all. And rather than a single laxative, you can use laxative combinations. Now how do you classify laxatives? The bulk forming laxative. Probably the commonly used drug used by our gastroenterologists, medical gastroenterologists and surgical gastro people is the ispagula husk, which increases the bulk of the stools. Lubricants, they soften the stools. Classical example is liquid paraffin or carnaffin. Osmotic laxatives, again, lactose syrup, a favored uh, cathartic by most of the doctors and medical profession. Available as loose. Magnesium sulfate is also used as osmotic laxatives. Stimulant laxatives, as the name indicates, they stimulate the colon or small intestine. Example is bisacode. In India, bisacode is available, but Senna is not available in India because it has got action on small intestine also. Senna. It's a natural product. Then comes surface wetting. But in our practice, we use a lubricant like liquid paraffin and stimulant laxative like this alcohol. And remember, in morphine induced constipation, never use bulk forming laxatives because if you use ispagla husk, the amount of stool is going to be larger and morphine have caused slowing of the intestine and the problem is reversing. So in opioid induced constipation, the drugs of choice are known as a stimulant laxative like bisacode plus a stool softener like liquid paraffin. Now how to manage? Suppose it is an impacted heart feces. There are many prescriptions available. You can go for glycerin suppositories. You can go for manual rectal evacuation. You can go for retention enema. You can go for saline rectal lavage. So you can go for high phosphate enema. But practically, the best thing is manual rectal evacuation after a high phosphate enema. We use phosphate enema with a 45 centimeter diameter. This picture shows this is the sachet of phosphate. You can see the nozzle also. If you suspect high obstruction, that means the constipation, chronic constipation with heart stools higher, instead of 
or you can attach a suction catheter, a long suction catheter to the nozzle. The catheter commonly used one is a green one, which is about 45 centimeter. You can introduce through the rectum gently because if you force the catheter, forcefully it can perforate rectum. So gently introduce this 45 centimeters of catheter into the rectum, which will reach the some part of colon. Then you attach the nozzle of the enema and squeeze it. You can put a pillow under the buttock so that this enema fluid flows proximally and soften the stones. Then you can go for manual rectal evacuation. This is how you do manual rectal evacuation. There is a hard impacted faces. What about soft impacted faces? Here you can use bizarre coding suppositories, 10 to 20 million them available. And always make sure that you put the suppository not inside the stool matter. You make sure that the suppository is in contact with the rectal mucosa. Then only the rectum will be stimulated and the stool will come out. Suppose it is not a non impacted faces, you can use oral words like bisacodyl or senna. Bisacodyl is a stimulant laxative and you can add oral liquid paraffin as a stool soft. This accordingly is usually given as 10 milligram HS and liquid granulation is usually given as 10 to 20 ml HS. Now remember, constipation can present with atypical symptoms like nausea or abdominal distension, presenting with diarrhea, always exclude constipation because it could be an overflow diarrhea. Always titrate the dose of laxatives according to the scopes. For example, you have started a cap dipolax 2 inches and liquid to market 10 ml inches. Patient still suffers from constipation. You can increase the dosage of dipolax as 2 dA instead of inches and increase the liquid to market dosages 10 to 20 ml inches and then 20 ml dA. So, this stepwise titration of laxatives can only especially opioid induced constipation. Methadone and fentanyl are less constipating than morphine because morphine causes constipation and patient will never develop problems to constipation. And osmotic laxatives lose. It's a favored uh, laxative by majority of doctors. It is not ideal for chronic use because it is an osmotic laxative which can cause electrolyte imbalance on long term use. And it is extremely sugary also, and it is costly. Rescue animals. Suppose fish is not moving bubbles, you can advise them to have the suppositories so that they move bubble every three days. So, just for completion's sake, I would like to discuss one case. This boy I met years back, he was suffering from paraplegia after power from height. When I met him, his main complaint was, in addition to of course paraplegia, was the constipation. He said, he was passing very hard stools. My question is, can we prescribe him Dapalax 2 HS and liquid trimargin 10 ml HS for his constipation? I would like some, someone of you to respond to his question whether we can use the usual uh, stimulant and softener combination for this particular patient. Night dosage of dalkalax and liquid liquid paraffin. For this boy, we suffering from paraffin. You can give it. Okay. Dalkalax usually available as enricotter tablets. Once it is swallowed, its action is set by about six to eight hours. And if you give a night dose of dalkalax, the patient is likely to move his bubble in the early morning hours. So 
So for a normal person, it is okay. Of course, we have to think about the social background of this boy also. Because his father died, his mother, after cooking food and keeping near his bed, goes for work in the early morning. Nobody at home during the daytime. There are many friends nearby. They come by 6 or 7 p.m. in the evening. And then they do all this cleaning and everything. So that means the routine prescription for a normal person is not ideal for this. So I would suggest rather than giving oral nalcolax, of course, the bubble is likely to move by about 6 to 8 hours. And the boy will remain in these tools till somebody comes. The ideal medicine would be perrectal nalcolax or a combination of nalcolax or um, liquid uh, glycerin or phosphatase. Because the friends can come and put the suppository or enema, they can wait for 15 to 20 minutes. He'll be moving his bowel, then he can, they can clean him. And you can also give the dietary advice like adequate oral fluid intake, the change in diet, especially taking more fruits, and also some amount of physiotherapy, movement to the upper torso so that activity is enhanced. So all these additional advices you can do. So I showed this case just to show you that the routine uh, prescriptions may not be suitable for all patients. So always you uh, select your medications depending upon the, the social characteristics, <coughs> social surroundings. Any other any other queries regarding constipation? We can take few questions and then move on with the case presentation. Hello. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, is the treatment for spurious diarrhea the same as constipation? Because uh, usually when we give uh, any laxative to such patients, they have a lot of spurious diarrhea. And uh, that, I that is a major cause of distress for them, more than the constipation itself. Is the treatment, uh, so you were asking is the treatment for spurious diarrhea is same as that of managing constipation. Like if you give laxatives, huh. she says the spurious diarrhea will increase. No, no, no. So it's the uh, uh, it's management is same as that for constipation. The spurious diarrhea happens okay. because of chronic constipation. Actually, it's a complication of constipation where the stools could not be moved out. They started disintegrating at the top. And this liquid stool started seeping between the heart stools and the colonic wall, and finally moving out through the anal canalus, incontinence of feces. So here the important point is eliciting the proper history. Whenever somebody comes with history of diarrhea, always elicit history of constipation. If there is history of constipation for a few days prior to diarrhea, of course, combining with a clinical examination like palpation can to diagnose that patient is coming from chronic constipation. So here the management is same as that for constipation. I had a patient, a CRF patient, uh, father of our gynecologist, had the same complaint. The gynecologist told me that my father is having diarrhea for the last two to three days. And then I asked her, this particular leading question, is there any history of constipation? And then she said, yes, my father had constipation for a five days prior to that. And we naturally thought that his constipation is late and he is moving all these tools in the home of diarrhea. So actually the patient is suffering from chronic constipation with this complication. So the management is same as that of constipation. And for that particular case, I advised enema. I up high up enema with catheter and he responded well. And then I, I advised to have the uh, oral stimulant laxatives and liquid stimulant to prevent constipation. Is it clear? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. 
uh, was your question specifically about oral giving oral laxatives when a patient is having serious diarrhea? Um, no, no, just, okay. no, just, in the... just to make myself clear. Because this particular symptom of diarrhea is misleading also many a times. So hearing the word diarrhea, we start writing. Never do that. Whenever a patient complains of diarrhea, elicit history regarding constipation. So we move on to the case presentation by uh, Dr. Jacqueline. Dr. Mary Jacqueline, uh, can we start the case presentation? Can you hear me? Yes, 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 very yes. yes. Yeah. I'm presenting on sister 75 year old, religious nun. She's a retired teacher. Uh, she presenting complaints was loss of appetite, nausea, vomiting, fatigue for two months. History of presenting complaints. She was apparently well three months back. Then she developed pain over the right shoulder and dry cough for which she consulted her physician. On examination, her physician found there were multiple lymph nodes in cervical and axillary region. For that, she underwent lymph node biopsy, which was reported as non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So she was advised chemotherapy. First cycle was given on 7th June. She has completed four cycles of chemo. On starting chemotherapy, she has lost her appetite, aversion for food with occasional vomiting, at times, it is so severe, she has to be given intravenous fluid. She also feels extremely tired, needs help to take care of her daily activities. Past history, she is hypertensive on regular treatment, no history of diabetes, asthma, history of ATT taken 1967, no history of any surgery in the past. No significant family history. Personal history, sleep disturbed, bowel bladder habits normal, appetite decreased, takes mixed diet. Treatment history, treatment for hypertension, nicardia, and she has complete. Sister Jacqueline, I think the voice, uh, the voice is not audible uh, now. And blood pressure 140, 70 milligram, three. Yeah. Yes. No pallor, itris, villonochia, clubbing. There are multiple lymph nodes in cervical and axillary region, bilateral, middle lady mount. On systemic examination, CVS S1 S2 heard no murmur. RS clear, no wrong eye or head crepitations, abdomen soft, no organomegaly, uh, CNS, no abnormal findings. On investigations, HP is 8.4, total count 6,900, platelet count 3,10,000, blood sugar 93, blood urea 18, creatinine 1, SGOT 16, SGBT 14, alkaline phosphatase 79, protein 4.4, bilirubin 0 0.8. Treatment history for chemo, she has received injection of rheumycin, vincristine, cyclophosphamide, pre medication as Abil, Rantac, injection dexa. And every after every cycle of chemo, she was advised. Tablet Domstall, one TDS for five days. Tablet Lorpose, one milligram HS, five days. Tablet Pantosid, 40 mg PD for five days. And tablet Prednisolone, 20 milligram PD, five days. And Ciprofloxacin, 500 mg PD for five days. 
and septron double strength pd for 4 weeks monday and thursday and tablet a cyclovir 200 mg pd 21 days tab embov od 2 days ultraset sos and syrup sucrophil 15 ml tds the diagnosis was 75 year old female with non hankins lymphoma on chemotherapy questions are how to improve her appetite and how to manage her fatigue thank you thank you dr jacqueline for the case presentation i would like to hear from the uh, other participants whether they have any comments on dr jacqueline's question uh, how to improve her appetite and fatigue is she is anemic yeah, she's anemic, 8.4 HP. And she has hypoproteinemia. Her total protein is only 4.6. Yeah. So we have to correct these two uh, deficiencies to overcome her uh, weakness. <coughs> Any other suggestions from other, other participants? Uh, Sister Valsala, I think uh, you are not audible. Uh, can you unmute yourself and uh, speak up, please? Uh, yeah, now you can talk. No, it's, you're not audible. Your voice is not audible. Uh, we have to access. In between it came, now it's not. It breaks in between. Now, now we can hear you. Yeah, we have to assess her for her depression. Since she has been diagnosed to have um, lymphoma, so any, any problem with her fatigueness? So your suggestion is to assess whether she has uh, any depression which is causing this fatigue, right? Yes. Any other points to be noticed? And after that, uh, we will ask Dr. Babaraj about his comments. Mm -hmm. Hello? Yes. Yes. Hello? Yes. Yes. Yeah. In the... Hello? Yes. Dr. Yes. Yeah. In, the, in the treatment part, one small suggestion, as she is on chemotherapy, uh, her uh, anti emetic could be instead of domestar, codensetron. Hello? Codensetron. Yes, yes. I heard. I heard. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we give SOS emeset actually. This is okay. a um, oncologist prescription. Okay. Five days. That is it. But SOS, we give it codensetron. Okay, okay, good. Mm. Thank you, Dr. Anthony, for the suggestion. Any other, uh, any other inputs from others? Hello. Yes. Yeah, you have not given the details of her food intake, what she has and what she eats. She eats mostly uh, boiled vegetables because her counts were down, sometimes total counts were down. So 
doctors have told nothing raw should be given so only boiled vegetables and other liquid diet mostly because uh, loss of appetite whatever we give she is not able to take in but she is taking food intake with uh, minimum minimum intake is there with the uh, soft diet and boiled vegetables those things is it the boiled vegetables causing her loss of appetite <laughs> <laughs> but other uh, masala also make her feeling nauseated okay no but uh, we should have asked for a diet chart from a dietitian for a terminally ill patient because uh, vegetables only contains vitamins it does not mm. have yeah, any that, calories or yeah, yeah, yeah the things she has uh, soft diet with rice kanchi and all those things his main problem is aversion to food little not the, what to take <laughs> whatever she is presented she feels she could have something else but when it comes she says she is not feeling to eat that is the problem so she needs a psychological evaluation to means how she has accepted the disease yeah apparently she looks she is accepted and she is cooperating with treatment but subconsciously still she must be resisting because she is she was a very active person suddenly diagnosed and put into she was in a very high position also is a very independent person now for everything has to be depend on somebody else must be costing her that problems thank you thank you thank you dr mercy that for the input to evaluating other aspects or our that that's also an important part in managing such symptoms yes okay to start an extent to start an extent her um, the loss of appetite to be the side effect of chemotherapy no yes sure and of uh, reassurance also and it was a transitory experience for a time being she will have it and uh, preparation and preparation to receive that and uh, the effect of that and when they when she comes to know uh, probably she was helped to take a more food the side effect will be less no yeah and so a kind of reassurance and a constant support and an understanding of what chemotherapy does probably yeah. it may help also a little more yeah yeah yes, yes. Uh, dr jackman you have mentioned nausea vomiting in the initial slide so is it uh, actually vomiting or is it just nausea because our yes, uh, just nause nausea occasional vomiting but uh, nausea is the major the nausea is also not so severe but just uh, aversion not able to eat don't want to eat don't feel like eating that kind of feel she is not retching or anything she is not doesn't have that physical thing but psychologically she is aversion to food like that uh dr mary mary abraham uh, would you like to comment uh about uh see one thing we could do is just uh ask her what she would like to eat maybe she is not liking the boiled vegetables and things like mm -hmm. that if she has any preferences what she wants to eat and uh, try to give it as small frequent meals like dr baburaj told uh, that yeah. it should be a varied menu and at different times maybe five times a day and uh, different things according to her wish sometimes we say that you must have this you must have that they don't mm -hmm. feel like eating it if she says i want one particular thing give that in small amounts yeah. and then, then i was wondering whether we can add a, a gaba antagonist also in case mm -hmm. she has that you know a little bit of a psychological uh, mm -hmm. also mm -hmm. that's my suggestion 
Yeah. Because yes, sir. Force them to take a high protein food, it's not good for you. Yeah. You need to build up your strength. All that will have meaningless for these patients. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, ma'am. But we tried this also. Every morning, uh, every meals before that, uh, someone uh, go and ask her. Today, what she, what you want to tell the kitchen to prepare for you? Achha, so they that. prepare, yeah, okay. they prepare that and give her. Uh -huh. So we are also trying her way to improve her nutrition. And plus, the psychological factors also need to be taken into consideration. Yeah, so yes. Maybe depressed, you know. And yeah. So maybe a so, benzodiazepine or an antidepressant also. I don't know. Dr. Yeah. Barbara will be able to <laughs> That only one difficulty that is, uh, she was a very independent person. I know, I know that. So that to accept even suggestions and a little difficult for her to be dependent on another is a little difficult. That factor also causing her maybe not open up to say, yes, I need support. That also is a factor as well. Yeah, I think we'll uh, ask Dr. Barbara as what he would like to add on to the existing suggestions. Uh, looking into that symptom, uh, list of the symptoms, I think nausea is the predominant one for her. Probably this chronic nausea is uh, making her afraid of taking foods or causing aversion to food. So we had to treat that chronic nausea. So as Madam suggested, a proclinic like metoprotomide, eat early would be good because it will mm. keep the stomach moving on and also mm. reduces and strengthens our LDS and also has an action on the mm. chemotherapy. As she is on chemotherapy, she can also be put on uh, serotonin or maybe second mm. Because and I think during that uh, few days, after chemotherapy, instead of five days, you can extend the seven to ten days. You can continue on MSF. Mm -hmm. So that will care, take care of our serotonin. And prophenetic properties will be provided by our metoprotonin. As Madam clearly said, she may be too much anxious. So mm -hmm. there will be a, a component of, uh, a cocky component also. So a night dose of glavacetone. Because I noticed that. She is suffering from insomnia. Her sleep is not regular. So addition of lorazepam at night will take care of her sleep as well. That uh, cortical component of nausea. So the combination of metoprotomide, uh, emicet plus lorazepam. I feel we take care of her chronic nausea. And as you said, she wants to be independent and probably I think she, she may be suffering from clinical depression because uh, before three months she was independent, now she is dependent on others, probably she is suffering from clinical depression and uh, there is no need to not only for sending her to a psychiatrist, also she can start antidepressants, how many want to use this acetylopin, next acetylopin is available. You can start at a dose of 5 milligram in the morning. You can gradually titrate to 10 milligram. So that is going to definitely only take depression and that also facilitates, will facilitate the attack. And I feel fatigue is related to anorexia or an independent entity. So once you treat the anorexia, fatigue can be managed. And I always think about correctable causes like oral pressure. Oral candidiasis is a big problem in patients who are chemotherapy and steroids. So we have the whole oral candidiasis. And constipation. Is she constipated? No, sir. That is not major complaint. Yeah. Oh. And that is sticking out of our diagnosis of small heart disease infrequently and with mm -hmm. <laughs> No, awesome. she never complained because she is constipated. Uh, because <laughs> that's, uh, layman's definition is different from our definition. So, mm -hmm. once again, insist whether she is having some constipation. 